All right, so why do you like beekeeping? Uh, it's, it's not the money and probably because I'm a little bit crazy. So the questions in module two are, where the heck do you get honeybees from anyway? And what kind of equipment do you need? Let's talk about the bees first. The hard way is buying a swarm trap and keeping your fingers crossed that some passing bees want to move in. Don't do that. You may never get bees. You want to buy bees from a reputable beekeeper that knows what he or she is doing. They come in two forms, packages and nukes. A uh, package bee is a a cage that has two to three pounds of bees and a queen in a cage and you get no drawn comb there's no resources other than a can of syrup that come with a package the bees if you would order them through the mail they would come in a box just like that and the postman will deliver them to your house usually the post office calls and uh, tells you come get your damn bees out of here <laughs> But don't worry, most people don't mail order their bees. They just pick it up from a local beekeeper. Now, the other form is a nuke, which is a mini hive. Uh, a nuke is really a miniature hive with a laying queen, brood in all stages, eggs, larva, pupa. And it has uh, honey in it, pollen. It'll, it'll really build fast. It can be five frames, that's what this is, or it can be three frames, could even be two frames. Five frames is popular. The package, it takes 30 days before you get anything as far as emerging bees, where the nuke, you have emerging bees immediately. And Bob has another suggestion when it comes to buying bees. The best thing to do, and I'm gonna go out on a limb and suggest this, if you can find a mentor that's willing to sell you a hive of bees, a complete hive of bees, that is probably the best way to start bees. That's essentially the way I started bees. All right, let's go over some equipment now. We'll look at this left to right. First, you see that EpiPen up there. We talked about this last lesson. That's so important just in case someone has a bad reaction. You'll also need to bring along a smoker, which will help calm the bees down. You'll need a hive tool to be able to pry open the top and pry apart each frame to inspect. You'll need some sort of smoker fuel. And you see here I put up some hamster bedding. That's cheap and it works really well. You need a way to light the fuel. And I have on here a propane torch, which is what I use. Uh, it's fast and even if it's windy, it works really well. You can use a match though if you want to. You need a flashlight in order to be able to quickly and clearly see down into each of the cells to check on eggs. And I would recommend you bring along a bottle of water. You'll get hot and dehydrated and things get sticky, <laughs> you might imagine. And so water is, is really helpful. You'll also need to bring a suit. You see Jim and me there. I made Jim put on his suit for this picture. Um, it protects your eyes. The veil is really important. Mainly you want eye protection, but I wear the full coverall you see there. Jim's just wearing a jacket. Whatever you feel comfortable in, but especially that veil over your eyes. Let's take a look at the components of the actual hive you're going to buy. These hives are on top of a building in downtown Pittsburgh, and we love this view, so I wanted to show you this. So these are three different hives in various stages. Let's take a closer look now at what's going on. You'll see the bottom two boxes there are the brood boxes, and brood are the baby bees, and that's where the queen's going to live then. She will lay all of her eggs down there in the brood box. There will be nectar and pollen and everything that the bees need in those bottom two boxes. The supers on top are slightly smaller, at least that's how I have my hive set up, and this is where only honey will go for the beekeeper. So the more supers we are able to add means the more honey that we're going to have. You can also see the outer cover goes on top. It's the roof. It's a little heavier. We can ratchet strap this hive together or put a brick on top just to keep that top from blowing off. Take a look at what we have there in between the brood boxes and the supers, though. 
a queen excluder, and it does just what the name says. It excludes the queen from the supers to ensure that she's just laying eggs down in those brood boxes. So when we take those supers off in the summer and in the fall to extract our honey, we know that there's not going to be any eggs up there because we're keeping the queen laying eggs just in those bottom two boxes. Here's a better look now at the queen excluder. And the worker bees can go through it with no problem, but the queen is just a little too big. And so this is what keeps her down below in the brood box. The whole hive sits on top of a bottom board and you'll have a choice of a solid or a screened in one. In terms of the hive stand, there are lots of choices. You see in this example, we have two cinder blocks. We've also built some stands out of wood and Bob has some good suggestions too. Uh. Hives should be up in the air a little bit just to, you know, it, it does a couple of things. It gets them away from the moist ground. You know, if it's wet out, the ground is moist. Bees won't do as well in too moist of conditions. So you want to have them up in the air, you know, more than four inches, I feel. You know, a foot is nice. Uh, although if your hive does really well, then it gets very tall and it can fall over. So your stand needs to be made well. If you can get yourself some railroad ties, they're the most stable thing you can find. Cement blocks work okay sometimes. Uh, you have to be aware that if your hive is in a, you know, facing to the south, sometimes in the wintertime, frost will get in the ground. And then as the sun melts it on the south side of the hive, the hive could fall over. Uh, so, you know, railroad ties are much more stable. They're dark, they absorb heat, you know, in the winter. Where do you get railroad ties? Well, you can buy them at some of the, the depot stores. Uh, you know, you can always find somebody to get you a railroad tire too. Uh, those seem to work best. And that came from an old timer by the name of Al Stankus. So, you know, from years and years ago, uh, you know, he's, he suggested that to me. And, uh, you know, I have some yards like that. Uh, probably the second best thing to use is uh, you can get these freezer panels from, uh, you know, that these large coolers are made of. Uh, you can get sections of that. Sometimes guys are throwing those away and you can put them down on the ground to keep the weeds from growing and uh, the bees do well on top of those. So as we pull out, you now have a really good idea of what's going on with my beehives. The one in the middle is amazing. There are one, two, three, four, five supers, which means I'm gonna get a lot of honey. The one on the left did not make any honey for me. There's just enough honey for them to last all winter. And the one on the right made two boxes of honey that I'm gonna take back. So again, now you know exactly what's going on in terms of how much honey these hives are making. Now let's go out to Jim, who will dismantle the whole hive to give us a closer look. Okay, we're gonna talk about what a hive component is, your different parts of the hive. So we're going to start from the top and go down just because the hive's together. Uh, we put a brick on it, hold it down. Sometimes we ratchet strap them. This brick can be a wealth of knowledge. This is the way I normally put a brick. If for some reason, maybe a queen issue, I may turn it up like that. If a hive is dead or it's in critical condition, I'll hang it over the front. So this can be, this can tell you what's going on in the hive. If you got a lot of hives and you don't remember. This is your inner. It's a telescope and it goes down over. We also have migratory covers. Commercial beekeepers use them a lot. Uh, not so much with that. This is your inner cover. It has a deep side and a shallow side. For the summer, you have your uh, shallow side done. The winter time, you put your deep done, and that you can put fondant, uh, baggies with sugar water in it, something else. If you would do this in the summertime, a strong hive, they'll fill this all up with bark comb. And you might have 10 pounds of honey in there, which is uh, not something you really want. Uh, this is a honey super. Uh, there's no honey in it right now, but uh, that's what we use for honey supers. We have a queen excluder right here, and this, the worker bees can go through it. 
but the uh, the queen can't. So it keeps them from uh, keeps the queen out of the honey supers because there's nothing that the bigger pain whenever you take honey supers off and you find the queen's laid in it, or worse yet, the queen's still there and you hold her back to your honey hives. So. And this is a single brood chamber. You can have one or two brood chambers when you do it. This is a, a single. Now this is a, a screen bottom board. You can see it's got some dead bees on it. Screen gives it a little better ventilation. It also permits a uh, Varroa mite like to fall through and get out. And we'll talk about that nasty Varroa mite a lot more coming up. But right now, let's talk more about the actual hive. When it comes to your hives, you will have some decisions to make, and it's all about the size. They come in 8-frame or 10-frame choices, and that's talking about the width, or shallow, mediums, and deeps, and that's talking about the depth. And it all depends on how strong you are, really. I cannot lift a 10 frame deep when it's filled with honey. There's no way, I'm just not strong enough. These supers are 10 frame and they can weigh, here, let me pick this up, Jim. They can weigh as much as 60 pounds when they're full. And when this is ready to extract, we're gonna have to be taking these off, loading them up, hauling them back in to extract. Um, these are 10 frames, and again, a full 10 frame is going to weigh about 60 pounds. Uh, I like to work with the 8 frames because they only weigh 40 pounds, and 40 pounds is still really heavy, um, but it's a little bit more manageable. So that's just something to keep in mind. Of course, you'll get more honey this way with the smaller boxes. You'll have to keep adding them. Um, yeah, you just keep putting more boxes on, but again, then once, you know, how tall do you want it to be? So that's just uh, one thing to think about when you're trying to decide what kind of boxes to get. Uh, it, it's, it's my feeling that the equipment that you use should be sized to what you can handle. In other words, if you can't pick up deep supers, you probably should maybe use medium supers. But what you have to understand is you can't always buy uh, a nuke that'll, you know, somebody won't sell you a nuke in medium a lot of times. So, uh, you know, the best thing you can do is uh, keep all boxes the same size, in my feeling. Uh, if you use all deeps, use all deeps. If you use all shallows or all mediums, uh, you know, if you use eight frame stuff, use all eight frame stuff. If you why? Use, why is that? Because it's versatile. You can mix and match way easier. A lot of older people use uh, eight frame, and some people don't use deep deep brood chambers at all. They'll use, instead of two deeps, they'll use three mediums. And their equipment's all interchangeable. I don't like deeps for brood chambers. I'd rather give the bees full access to a deep hive. And you're not really moving deeps. They can weigh over 100 pounds when they're full of honey and bees, but you're not moving them much. So I, I still do all right with the deeps. A lot of ladies and older people that start out will get A-frame equipment right off and they'll stay with that. Uh, or they'll start with just mediums and that's all they'll use. All right, here's my advice on assembling those hives. It's pretty self-explanatory, but I'm gonna at least tell you how I mess things up in the past so you don't do the same. You start out with the wood glue first, and you put that in the tongue and groove parts and glue it together before you then nail them together. It's really important to get the handles all going the same direction and to all be facing on the outside of the hive. For the long sides, it'll be a pain not to have a handle to grab onto. The most important parts though are the shorter ones because see these grooves? That's what holds the frames in place. So it is of utmost important that they all be the same way, those grooves there on the inside and the handles on the outside all facing the same way. Because once the glue dries, you can't switch it around. So before you start nailing it together, triple check that all the handles are on the outside and facing the same direction. 
In terms of painting the hive, you can pretty much do whatever you want with outdoor paint or outdoor stain. Just know that lighter colors helped deflect the heat and the darker colors absorb the heat. So depending on how the weather is in your area, that might be a really important thing to think about. We've done a lot of our hives in all white. I've stained some in orange and yellow to match colors of pollen. And we've even had a painting party with a youth camp to let the kids just do whatever they want. You will need a smoker, and it does a couple of things. First of all, it masks the alarm pheromone when you open up the hive, which by the way, smells like bananas. If you smell bananas, you know the bees are sending out a warning signal about you. It also might make them think that the hive is on fire, so they'll start gorging themselves with honey, and they'll be so busy doing that, preparing to flee the burning hive that they won't bother you, and you need to inspect them to care for them. So a smoker is a must every time you open up the hive. When it comes to the frames, like everything else, you're gonna have some choices. There are plastic foundation frames and wax foundations. And the plastic ones are easier to put together and they stay together when you're extracting a lot better because they're more sturdy. But the bees like the wax foundation frames better in my experience. We'll talk a little bit about foundations. Now we use these terminologies and what it is is it gives the bees, they'll build the comb where we want it. They don't need this to build comb, but to be usable for us, we need this. So this is plastic, it's embossed with uh, self size that we want, and it's coated with beeswax. Uh, bees don't like it quite as well as the, this is natural beeswax foundation. They like this a lot better. It's wired. It has wires uh, vertical. And then we put two horizontal wires in it. That's because these are going to be honey supers. And when we run them through an extractor, there's a lot of side pressure on them. Because this can weigh uh, seven, nine pounds whenever it's full of honey. So it's not light. And then once the bees draw it out, whether it's plastic or that, this is the comb. And they actually put it the way we want it. Uh, this is for a honey super, so it'll last. You can see I damaged it here a little bit. The bees will fix that. Anything we do wrong, bees can fix it really quick. Entrance reducers are a small removable piece of wood or metal that allows either a lot of bees to get in and out or just a few at a time. When a hive is big, it's important that there's enough room for a lot of bees to come and go at the same time. But when you narrow down the entrance, it will help the bees guard the hive from other insects or critters like mice trying to get inside or even other honeybees trying to rob them because this gives them a smaller space they have to guard. There's a lot of people who leave this on year round. Now it can be wood, it can be a lot of things. This keeps, cuts down the entrance, but it also keeps mice out. Mice are a big problem in the winter time. They'll get inside a, a bird chamber where the bees aren't, and they'll, uh, build their nest in there, urinate, uh, just make a mess of it, eat the comb. And come spring when it gets warm, if they're still there, the bees will kill them. And they'll try to, they'll actually clean all, the, they'll get all the hair off them, they'll do everything but the hard whiskers, and then they'll propolize them, they'll mum mummify them to where they're shiny, and they're, uh, so they use the propolis just to uh, make it more sanitary. And a mummified mouse sounds pretty gross, so be on the lookout for that. And that wraps up your equipment needs and where you get bees. So let's buzz on over to Module 3.